Hello everyone, this is Sean Taylor, Field Application Scientist Manager for BioRad in Canada. And in this segment of the ultimate qPCR experiment, we will be discussing primer and sample validation. The problem associated with working with non-validated primers in new samples from a new experiment are that the primers may not reflect the true concentration of the nucleic acids in each sample. This is particularly the case when extracting RNA and then converting to cDNA from samples from a new experiment where it would be uncertain if the level of contaminants, protein and chemical contaminants that might be resi residual from the RNA extraction could vary between the individual biological replicates. In this circumstance, we could have three biological replicates, mouse one, mouse two, and mouse three, where in green, this cDNA has low levels of contaminating protein and chemicals, whereas the third sample has high levels of contaminating protein and chemicals. And those chemical and protein contaminants could affect the nature in the way the primers anneal and also the TAC activity, leading to amplification curves where for the low level of contaminants, the green curves, the CQ values come up much lower, the curves amplify and therefore give lower CQ values than the sample that has a higher level of contaminants, which comes up, the amplification curves come up much later giving much higher CQ values. In the case where these would be three biological replicates from the same biological group or treatment group, let's say these were three control samples, we would have very high variability within one set of samples. And this would lead to potentially non-statistically significant data. How do we solve this problem in qPCR, and that is by validating the primers. Primer validation is essential to assure high quality data from a qPCR experiment. And primer validation starts by generating a pooled sample. This, the choice of the sample in which to validate primers is critical. And the sample that is recommended is a pooled sample from each of the individual biological replicates. So in this case, if these were samples from various treatment groups now, then I would pool these together so that I would end up with one representative sample that contains the average of the quantity of target for all the different targets in the entire experiment. So this would be a pool of biological replicate cDNA samples from each of the treatment groups so that it's an equalized pool generating the average of the expression of all the targets for the experiment in one sample. The other advantage of generating this pooled sample is it would also contain the average of all of the contaminants in all the samples in the experiment making it a very nice representative sample in which to test all the primer pairs for validation. We typically recommend diluting this sample by a factor of approximately 1 in 20, and that would be simply to dilute out uh, potential contaminants that would reside in the samples to give good amplification. And the very first experiment to perform with this pooled cDNA or genomic DNA sample would be a thermal gradient experiment. Now, with BioRad CFX real-time instruments, the plate can be partitioned into eight temperatures by row. So this would permit, in each column, the ability to test one set of primer pairs at eight different temperatures. On a 96-well plate that contains 12 columns, that would permit the testing of 12 primer pairs at eight separate temperatures. The recommended temperature range is between 51 and 63 degrees, but of course this range 
could change depending on the AC, uh, the ATGC content of the primers. So if the primers are calculated to anneal at a predicted lower temperature than around 60, then this temperature, 12 degree temperature range, should be moved a little bit lower or a little bit higher depending on the predicted annealing temperature of the primers around 60 degrees. The data generated from a thermal gradient looks like what we see here, where we see potentially in the highest temperature, no amplification curve at all because the primers are not annealing at, at the 63 degrees, the highest temperature. And then as the temperature decreases in the gradient going down the column from A to H, as we see here, A to H, the curves come up at lower and lower cycles until they converge at the lowest cycle threshold, which would be the most efficient annealing temperature range for the primers in that pooled sample. So in this particular case, the primers anneal at a lower temperature than, than one might expect, perhaps between 51 and about 54, 55 degrees in this case. At this temperature range, within this temperature range, it is also an excellent um, experimental protocol to take one of the samples that were amplified and run those samples, run that sample on a gel to assess that the product is running at the correct molecular weight. So we would like the amplicon obviously to run at the proper molecular weight and even cutting this band out of the gel and submitting that amplicon for sequencing is an excellent approach to fully assure that the right product is being amplified. Of course, a melt curve should be run if this is a cyber-based assay to assess a single peak and the melt curve should coincide with the melt curve. The gel and the melt curve should both coincide by giving a single band on the gel and a single peak with the melt curve. The next step in the process after thermal gradient validation is to perform a standard curve. Standard curve can only be performed once the correct annealing temperature has been uncovered in the thermal gradient experiment because the standard curve needs to be run at the optimal annealing temperatures for the primers. The standard curve is a serial dilution series of the pooled cDNA sample that was used for the thermal gradient. And the standard curve looks exactly like what we see here in this figure, where each dilution represents a dilution factor that was calculated to determine the correct dilutions to produce an excellent standard curve. The dilution factor for the standard curve, the dilution factor for the pooled cDNA sample can be determined from the thermal gradient. So if we go back to the thermal gradient, if at the optimal annealing temperature, the thermal gradient data is between 10 and 16 cycles. So let's assume that at the lowest CQ value in the thermal gradient for a given set of primers, the amplification curves come up between 10 and 16 cycles, then dilute the pooled cDNA sample by a factor of one in eight for the standard curve in series. If at the optimal annealing temperature, the amplification curves come up between 16 and 23 cycles, use a one in four serial dilution series with the pooled cDNA sample. And if the amplification curves in the thermal gradient at the optimal annealing temperature come up above 23 cycles, use a one in two serial dilution series with the pooled cDNA sample. A good standard curve contains eight points. It may be required to delete points at the ends of the standard curve to achieve an appropriate slope. 
which defines the reaction efficiency. Reaction efficiency should be between 90 and 110 percent for the reaction. That would define an excellent assay that is working well with the pooled sample. And of course, the samples should then be diluted, the individual samples, because this standard curve was generated from a pool which represents the average expression of that particular target. So the individual samples associated with that particular primer pair should be diluted to the middle of the associated standard curve for that primer pair. And that will give room for all the individual samples to either fall below the midpoint or above the midpoint of the standard curve, but still fall on the standard curve. All the unknown samples for a given experiment should fall within the valid range of the primer validation standard curve to confidently be able to assure that the CQ values that are generated in each individual sample are consequent to the concentration of the target molecules in the sample and not consequent to potential contaminants in the samples. This is the purpose of the standard curve is to determine how to dilute the individual samples to assure the contaminants are at a low enough level that they don't impede the reaction and change the CQ values consequent to their concentrations. So as we see here at the end, we end up with our biological replicates. So these would be the same replicates we saw in the initial slide, mouse one, mouse two, and mouse three, but that were adequately diluted using the standard curve. So now the contaminants are all at low levels, permitting efficient qPCR reaction and primer annealing, giving amplification curves that are much, much tighter, closer together within the same biological group to minimize variability and increase the chances of having nice statistically significant data between the treatment groups.